Coming up on Theater Talk. I don't look at Broadway dance on a whole. I don't, on a whole, look at a lot of dance. On a whole, I work a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and on a whole, I'm still doing my morning exercises at 6 o'clock. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. to the pile that was here. Oh, I straightened up. Oh, God, no. Why the hell did you do that? Remember, before you left, I asked if you'd like me to straighten up a little bit? Straighten up, yes. Reorganize my life. No, I did not authorize you to reorganize I'm my sorry, life. I'm sorry. I really didn't I do anything. I thought when you said I... straighten up, you meant take a schmatt and dust. Dusting the place could use. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. One of my favorite actresses, one of New York's favorite actresses, is Linda Lavin. She won a Tony Award for a brilliant production of Broadway Bound originally, and she's back on Broadway in Collected Stories with another Tony nomination. I believe, Linda, it's your fifth fifth Tony nomination. Yeah. A Tony Award for Broadway Bound. Yes. Nomination for The Last of the Red Hot Lovers. Yes. Tale of the Allergist Wife. Right. Uh, Collected Stories. And what's the one I'm missing? Diary of Anne Frank. Of course, oh, of right, course. right, right. So you and Hal, you're gaining on Hal Prince, I think. Oh, I love that. <laughs> well, welcome, <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to Theater Talk, and Thank congr you so congratulations much. on Collected Stories, a terrific performance. Thanks very much. Um, now, this play by Donald Margulies is about um, uh, uh, an older writer who lives in isolation. Yes. Teaches students, um, and one of the students comes in who's a big fan of hers, and. Can you sort of tell us why the woman decides that this student, out of all, is the one she's going to let into her life after all of these years really living away from people? Sure. I, it happens to me every night. Sarah Paulson plays this young woman, uh, Lisa Morrison, brilliantly. And she came with a, an, an, an adoration and an energy and a sweetness and a vitality and all the intelligence and humor that Sarah Paulson has, along with a great talent mm. and did an audition that just blew our socks off mm. and Lynn Meadow and I looked at each other and thought well this is the first scene isn't it you know this ah. is somebody who is earnest young and, and adoring and earnest right. and you know but now remember in the play the girl then does stuff to the but I don't mean it adoring as <laughs> and it's in a sycophantic way right, right, you know right. uh, the girl in the play comes on with that adoring the adoration yes. for them but then yes. she d does things she yes, steals the woman's life so and you better watch out as an actress so Sarah, I better but, watch out yeah. yes <laughs> and 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 people have you you know, uh, equated this play with uh, All About Eve, but it Very is much. not All About Eve, and there is no, we, I believe, no intention in this girl to uh, usurp a position. I hadn't seen this play before, but after about 15 minutes in, I turned to my friend and said, show her the door. Watch wow. out. <laughs> Isn't that you, something? You, you let Eve it, Harrington into the house. Exactly. <laughs> well, you have to a me, perceptive <laughs> and, <laughs> and a distrusting mind. That's and, and you know, so, so does Ruth. That's it, right. Ruth doesn't jump in, no. but she doesn't, th she doesn't show her the door. Yeah. But she's still very careful, but not careful enough, I guess, when you know the, the, the outcome. Yeah. Still, you know, with all of us who have trust issues, and I'm the first to admit that I do, and I work very diligently on them because I want to connect with people mm -hmm. and I want to be in loving relationships. So I have to look at w where my mistrust comes from and where those issues uh, are triggered for me. Mm -hmm. With those of us who have those issues, we are either walled up mm -hmm. And in, in, and in effect, we, we cut off the possibility of fantastic relationships or, or events in our lives. Is this something that you, you always had? And then I would imagine as the success came, like Ruth, you become famous, you became famous, certainly through television and Alice. Does that then, you wall yourself off even more? Because now you're really going to be surrounded by the sycophants you have to watch out for. It's a different kind of wall, you know. There's a, there's a boundary, mm -hmm. and then there's a wall. And I think we deny that wall as, as people who um, are as 
co connected as I was as a young person, as a performer, mm -hmm. that when we delude ourselves into thinking that performing is love, mm -hmm. and we get up on the kitchen table and tap dance for the company, mm -hmm. and we think that that's uh, getting and giving love, what it is is getting and giving, uh, at least getting attention and being the center of attention. Mm -hmm. That doesn't that doesn't have anything to do with trusting human beings into it to come into your heart, let alone into your apartment. You know, <laughs> were you the it, little girl who was on the I was a little girl dancing tap dancing for, for the company and playing the piano and s singing songs on the beach for all my mother's friends. You know, I was a friendly little kid. I came to New York, you know, and I I was so excited to be here when I came as a young person mm. that I was an easy target. You know, I, I didn't have, I had a lot of vulnerability and not very good boundaries. I hope you had some fun, though. And I had a lot of fun. And and I, you know, I had a lot of fun. Absolutely. I want to ask you about those early days, because you've had an extraordinary career on Broadway. And am I remembering this correctly? Wasn't there a Walter Kerr review that pointed you out in the chorus of a show? That was Norman Nadel. Norman, that's what the critic Norman Nadel, yes. That's right. And, and what was that story? You that were... was amazing. Yeah. Uh, the story is I auditioned for and got into the chorus of A Family Affair written by John, John Kander, Kander and, and James and William Goldman. Goldman. Right. This is before Fred Ebb. Right. And I was in the chorus, got to Philadelphia, and the show was not going well. Mm -hmm. And they brought in a young man named Hal Prince <laughs> to take a look at the show. He had been a production stage manager and a producer. That's right. And he was mentored by George Abbott. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it. I was on the payphone backstage at the Walnut or I don't I think it was the maybe it was the Schubert, I don't know, in Philadelphia. And and Hal Prince, this Dynamo walked in backstage into the theater. We knew something was going on, you know, some, somebody was coming. <laughs> and I, I was on the phone, and he looked at me and pointed to me and said, you're terrific, and kept going. Went to the stage, <laughs> and we were all assembled on the stage, and we were introduced to Hal Prince. He was now going to be the director of the show. He changed the set. He made a lot of changes behind closed doors I don't know anything about. Mm. But one of the changes was he gave me five speaking parts, one at a time. They, they rewrote the show, so there was a need for a, a woman in a shop and a girl at a party and the old lady in the dressing uh, as a seamstress. And so I started getting all these parts, these little one-line parts and little bits of songs, which was great in those days because you got five bucks for every part you got, <laughs> another extra five bucks. And so Hal Prince launched me as a speaking artist on stage. I had that was my first Broadway show. Mm. I was happy to be in the chorus, believe me. It took yeah, me you a week were... to get that job. Mm. It took me a week of auditions to get that job. My mother even came to one of those auditions and sat in the in the house and Did you have a Mama Rose a mother. type mother? I there? think so that week. <laughs> and we open on Broadway and my mother and I, my mother came for the opening, mm -hmm. went to um, someplace for a coffee and a muffin mm -hmm. and uh, Shrafts. Yeah. And opened the paper. Th those were in the days that I read reviews. Yeah. Oh, you it's very hard for me now to read them because I don't, I don't want to become self-conscious about them. I, I have to admit, I read yours and I read the Times, and then I saw, I thought, That's stop, it. you know, because. <laughs> but Norman Nadel said it. Norman Nadel said, "There's a girl in the chorus." Yeah. Uh, something. I mean, it was just remarkable. I thought my mother was making it up when she read it to me. <laughs> stop it. You and know? you never looked back. No, I never looked back. It yeah. was, um, it was such a. A force of um, a, a, a positive thrust of validation for me. I mean, it was beyond anything I could have imagined. Can you tell us just one or two things that you learned from Hal Prince that uh, really shaped your your life and your career? Because he's he's a legend in the business. He's a force of nature. To work with Hal Prince, to be in a room with Hal Prince with the devotion and the commitment and the passion that he has for this work mm -hmm. and for performers, the joy that he has, mm -hmm. what he gives you with that energy. Mm -hmm. You want to come to work every day with him. You want to be in that room with him. When you do a technical rehearsal with Hal Prince and you listen to him and watch him work with all the people he's gathered around him who are the cream of the crop, the best of the best, and to watch him take a visual vision, an emotional, uh, a theatrical vision to its limit, mm. to be in the presence of that energy and that devotion and that commitment, that theatrical knowledge, the love that he brings is such a gift. And it gives me the desire to, to, to continue to do what I've always wanted to and do. And he clearly had an eye for talent. 
Huh. And he gave you my favorite Charlie Strauss song, Possibilities, is, Possibilities. In, in Superman, which I always loved. Yeah. And he knew that was a perfect song for you. He Just... made me audition three times for that. Really? Do you have time? Yeah, sure. When I knew he was going to do Superman, I went into one of those photo booths that we used to have, you know, five yeah, yeah, for a yeah, buck. For the passport. For that's it. right. That's right. And I bought a hat for myself, a green hat in the millinery area. And I put a little orange. It would be very attractive right now because orange is so popular. <laughs> put a little orange band around it. Put it on my head. Found a Superman comic book. Went into a booth and took pictures of myself as Lois Lane. <laughs> And slapped these little, you know, these little <laughs> rectangular pictures onto the comic book and sent it to his office. <laughs> By the way, Hal is somebody who, when I was out of work, I could go to his office and say, have you got anything? Hmm. And he, he put me in a show. The show closed that week, but he said, you can go into this show. I won't name what it was. Yeah, yeah. But he, he was that kind of person. Right. He would give you work if he had it. And so, anyway, I put all these pictures on the comic book, mm -hmm. and I send it to him. And he calls me up, and he says, that's a brilliant audition, but you can't be Lois Lane. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, you're just not Kansas enough. But he said, I have another part. Mm -hmm. And he said, come and audition for it. So I did. And I sang, what, it's almost like being in love, which was my audition song. Oh, yeah. And then they said, uh, learn this song and come back. And they gave me possibilities, yeah. which is a really difficult song to learn. Really? I've seen possibilities, maybe more than meets the eye. <laughs> but you have that, I love that, uh, that line. I'm not going to, uh, um, how's it go? Uh, relax. How's it go? Uh, relax, sweetheart. I'm not going to bite you yet. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's wonderful. All right, well, Linda Lavitt, it's uh, uh, great to have you back on oh, Broadway great to in be Collected here with Stories. You, Michael, Congratulations thank you, on the Susan. fifth Tony nomination. There's nothing you can't play, I guess, except for Lois Lane. Thank you, except for Lois Lane. How do you like that? <laughs> A wonderful actress, Linda Lavin. Terrific in collect Collected Stories at the Samuel J. Friedman, Friedman Theater. Friedman Theater, West 47th Street. Produced by the Manhattan Theater Club. Just through June 13th. And congratulations again on the Tony nomination. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ruth, are you jealous? Oh, please don't condescend. I'm not. I'm sorry. It's I didn't... not about envy. Well, maybe it is about envy, but it's not about professional jealousy. <laughs> you know what it is. I'm jealous that you have all of life ahead of you. I can't just sit back and watch you do the dance I danced so long ago and not think about time. And that's what it is, don't you see? <sighs> time. These little town blues. Uh, I'm always happy to have a genius here at Theatre Talk, and I don't use that term lightly. This woman is a real genius, one of the great, great theatrical artists, Twyla Tharp. Welcome back to Theatre Talk. Thank you kindly. You were last here with uh, one of my favorite shows of all time, Moving Out, and Thank you're you. back on Broadway with a Frank Sinatra show, Come Fly Away With Me. Indeed. And, uh, well, and welcome back to Theater Talk. Thank you very much. Now, when I say genius, you, you're sort of like a certified genius because of the MacArthur grant that you got, and they give that to people they say are geniuses. Well, it's a strange word, genius. I think it means you work hard and have a lot of luck. <laughs> so you don't walk around thinking, I'm a genius? No. No, no, no. Just go to do the work and let other people decide. That's um, right. Uh, you've been nominated for a Tony Award for your choreography for Come Fly Away. I love the show, and I think people are very surprised that the show itself was not nominated for a Tony Award. Um, does that upset you that it wasn't nominated? We were surprised, and obviously anybody will be disappointed, but mm -hmm. uh, we don't work for awards. We work to do the work mm -hmm. and are ultimately very gratified that we're selling a lot of tickets and a lot of people are coming and that uh, what we do, what we have to offer, makes them feel better when they leave than when they came in. That's what counts. And as you know perfectly well, ultimately the best advertising is word of mouth. Mm. So Why a Frank Sinatra show? What is it about this man and this music that got you thinking of to create a Twyla Tharp world? Well, I have a long history with Frank. Mm -hmm. This is the fourth piece I've done with Frank. Uh, and I knew the man a bit. Really? Um, not 
well well, but he'd come to several shows and he um, he said he cried in the audience because he'd never heard his music uh, so beautifully sung and danced to, and he really wanted to be a dancer, not a, a, a singer. And I said, well, you do dance lovely, but uh, I suggest you don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> when did, what, now, you were doing, in, in, your, in your dance company, you were doing yes. songs, Sinatra songs. Nine Sinatra songs, which is what he saw at the Gershwin. Um, what year and, would that have been? Oh. Never ask me a date. Sorry. I don't remember the old ones. It's I don't remember the current time. ones, and I don't remember the new ones. <laughs> okay. So I don't remember dates. But but the chairman of the board came to see him. He did, and then when he actually received the Kennedy Center honors, he asked us to do a piece called Sinatra Suite for him right. in that performance. So we were we were greatly honored. Oh, the thing about Sinatra's uh, music is that as a performer, he was a wonderful musician. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he was also a great actor. Uh, and I always think that Frank probably thought of these songs, though I know, never talked to him about this, as aria. I don't think he thought of them as pop songs because the emotion is so intense in them. So uh, his performance tells you a great deal about the quality called love, which mm -hmm. is what our show is about, uh, utilizing umpteen trillion of the great American songbook. Uh, he, Sinatra, recorded over a thousand of them, mm -hmm. so that in structuring the score, I listened to a lot of them. And he, he reaches the gamut from joy to despair to, you know, frustration to exaltation. Come and fly with me to in the wee small hours of the morning. Wee it's small hours there. of the morning is a great one. The theme of this show is, is love. Correct. And we see people coming together, and we see the problems in their relationship. We see them going apart, trying to come back together, but of course all told through dance. Exactly. Uh, there are four couples who, who materialize out of this mishigash in mm -hmm. the opening where it's uh, you know just setting up the situation and the individual characters, and mm -hmm. then you see how the interrelationships solidify. And because I tend, in fact, am an optimist, we don't leave anyone out. <laughs> right. Now, um, we think about it. <laughs> there is some collateral damage, but we... Yes. For the evening, wrap everybody up nice. Yes, and there's yes. sex. There's a lot. Well, there's always well, there sex is, in your show. But it's part of the show, yeah. and it's part of the theme, and it's part of life. Yeah. And uh, it's part of Sinatra's world. Now, um, this show is uh, uh, very popular, and it seems because of Sinatra being an iconic figure, um, a more of a commercial kind of thing for you to do. Are you moving more in a, a commercial vein to be a, a part of Broadway and selling tickets and going in the direction of these more popular kind of... Uh, well, I've, I've never been opposed to having people come see my work. <laughs> right, and making a living from it. <laughs> and when I began, uh, I don't differentiate between art, commercial, uh, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I try to do the best work that I can do and make it as clear as possible. And if there's an impulse in it that communicates to people, great. Uh, but uh, it, it's, not, it's not pandering, it's not talking down to an audience to be in a Broadway theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's important to remember that uh, I probably mentioned this before because Graham was first, her, Martha's first Broadway appearance was at the Rogers. That's in right. the late 20s, I think. Uh, and she did a number of uh, concerts in mm -hmm. Broadway theaters. They were all limited engagements. She never did an open-ended run. Uh, but she, they're great theaters. Yeah. Uh, they're wonderful facilities. Uh, and uh, it's available to a, a broad public and perhaps a public that might not be so intimidated as going to the Metropolitan Opera House. When you look at Broadway dance on a whole, do you find it all that interesting? Because frankly, I, I feel there's a lot of generic stuff. I out don't there. look at Broadway dance on a whole. I don't, on a whole, look at a lot of dance. On a whole, I work a lot. Mm. Uh, and on a whole, I'm still doing my morning exercises at 6 o'clock. So I don't go in the morning, go out <laughs> very often. I find it interesting because you're, even though it's a, a dance musical, I mean, I, I call them tharpicals for, <laughs> for lack of a, I mean, they seem to be the tharpicals. They're unique to you. Um, but you're always, telling story. There is a narrative. There is a book. It's not just a dance concert, if you will. No, this is true. Uh, and it's a different kind of storytelling than happens in the ballet, um, mm. in that the ballet tends to identify its characters and its situation somewhat iconically, mm -hmm. uh, and by way of myth, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, what I'm doing here is character. Mm -hmm. uh, it's personality driven. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it requires that each one of the actors, each one of the characters, has their own vernacular. They have to speak in movement with their own accent so we can know who they are. Mm. So you almost. Um when you're talking to your dancers, do you speak to them the way, say, a director would an actor? Even if you have a small part, create the whole world that this character is. Absolutely. Where is he coming from? Where totally. did he grow up? All that sort of stuff. Absolutely. They, they all do their homework. They all know their moments before. They all think about their moments of finding the spontaneous in the repeated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the uh, whole business of subtext is extremely important in what we do. Uh, we will sometimes, the material will be evolved exactly like a scene where a director takes two actors and with their texts uh, places them. We will read into our music, our action. And that's it, your approach it, to it, it is dance. written out not in dialogue but in action. Yeah. And uh, the, but we also speak it. I mean there are times when I'll run a scene and, and the dancing we don't dance oh, and it's, it's like okay now what, what is, where, what's the beat at this point? And how much further are you towards actually disengaging from her now? Mm. And then, oh, okay, so I see, all right, well, let's put a pirouette in here and then let's Oh, do so it. you rehearse without the dancing. It's just yes. their uh, intro. Yes. Um, uh, will you ever do a more traditional book musical that has scenes and, you know, a, a sort of old-fashioned style? There's a very, style? very difficult problem with book musicals. Um, and I'm very interested in them. And that's the moment of segue, the joining point. The moment when the dramatic scene leaves to go into the augmented world, the greater reality the Sing of, the song. Sing the song. Yeah. Why do we do this? Uh, you know, I'm singing in the rain. Now, why is he singing in the rain? Okay, he is singing in the rain because in the previous scene, he's suddenly realized that he has a shot at success. Mm -hmm. So rain comes down and he's singing in it. And you can buy that uh, leap of faith, if you will. It's a leap of faith that has to be bridged every time a gap from a book scene is made into a musical production number. It's extremely difficult to do. I'm interested by but you it. Don't, but you don't seem to like the form that, all, that, that it's much. It's not that I don't like it. It's that I don't need it. Mm. Uh-oh. As, as, an, as what you do, the way you conceive it, you don't need that book scene I, to lead I, up to I, that. We're much faster, you see. Action is much <laughs> faster than language. Also, action is much more truthful than language. Language is useful in that it can lie quite nicely, which makes all kinds of complications. <laughs> Action is not, and it's very fast, immediate, and in some ways very primitive, why, which is why it speaks to people in the gut uh, more than through the head. It, it's located in a different part of the brain. I'm sure that this is being investigated as we speak. You see, I th I'm thinking yours is the dance through musical. Yeah. That's your form. Yeah, yeah. no, we, 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 we keep going with the action, and the trick, as I said in Moving Out, it's the same thing. To be specific enough so that the scene is driven by the reality of these characters and this point in time, and yet to leave enough room for the audience to put themselves into it. I mean, how many people out here in our audience have been dumped? We have a guy on stage who's dumped <laughs> by the woman he came in with. So what does he do? He ends up getting really sloshed and doing coming in right after she's left with another guy. Yes, sir, that's my baby. Right. Yeah, but when that happens to me, I can't just, you know, do pirouettes and... No, you need help. You need the right kind of shoe. I, I, I want to ask you one quick thing. Um, yeah. You did come to Broadway with The Times They Are Changing, which yep. was not a hit. Um, it was an interesting show, I thought, but not a hit. Was that painful? Was that the failure of that show painful? Look, let me say this. Uh, one never likes things to go down, okay? Yeah. But one also never says it's failed, because had it not been for doing that show, I wouldn't have pushed on with this mm -hmm. one, because when I started doing the Dylan, I started with the original idea was going to only be using Bob's love songs. He, Bob, Bob Dylan has written 40 or so really great love songs across the spectrum of love. And so that's where I went into that one. It evolved into something else mm -hmm. uh, with his political songs coming into the picture. Uh, but I never lost track of the feeling of those different kinds of conditions of love 
that are in his music that I was able to impose on some of the American songbook. On the, oh, so from the, from the Dylan comes the ideas for Sinatra. So from, Sometimes. From a show that doesn't work. Or didn't work. Uh, I thought it worked fine. Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Is there also, though, in you, I mean, you're a very driven person, that when that show didn't go, was there a part of you that said, I'm coming back to Broadway and I'm going to show them that I'm going to give no, them a hit? You never show people anything. Who you show something to is yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there is enough that I feel I've learned and have to express, then I have the opportunity to show others perhaps what I've learned. Mm. Well, I don't know. I think Come Fly Away should have been nominated for Tony. That's all I can say. Thank you. <laughs> but you were, and you really are a genius and one of my, thank you. One of my favorite uh, artists in the theater, Twyla Tharp. Thank you for coming on Theater Talk, and I hope you'll come back again. Thank you. With more Tharpicals. All right. More <laughs> dance through musical. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you make me feel so young. You make me feel like spring is sprung Every time I see you grin Such a happy individual The moment that you speak I want to run and play hide and seek I want to go and bounce the moon Just like a toy balloon our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>